I'm a child neurologist trained in the United States, in Philadelphia, and I remember the first time that I heard of a patient with um, AHC was while I was in my residency, and it was actually one of the other residents who had a child who came in again and again, and there were some questions about what was going on. And then when the diagnosis became um, known, even though we didn't know the gene at the time, I remember that he was telling me about it, and it was remarkable how such a, you know, we find the diagnosis and then we're always so optimistic that we have something to offer with treatment, that this was a, such a devastating diagnosis because the child wasn't doing so poorly at the time. So we started reading up on what had been written in the literature at that time, and I remember um, thinking that I was probably fairly lucky not to have to treat the patient myself <laughs> because there seemed to be not a lot that we could do and that the child was destined to have um, further decline in their cognition and, and these devastating attacks that would sort of take over their life. And then I moved back home to Iceland and started working and, and didn't think much about it. It wasn't something that was in my top 10 differential diagnoses at the time because I had only seen that one patient. Mm. And, um, and then I met Sunna. Um, when she started coming into our children's hospital in Iceland, um, probably around six months, the first time I saw her. And at that time, she just seemed like any other infant who was starting to have epilepsy. There was nothing about it that struck me unusual for the first couple of times that she came in. And then we started noticing that after each one of her supposed seizures, that she had a very prominent um, hemiparesis. And we know in epilepsy, and I'm a trained epileptologist, that you can have what we call a Todd's paralysis after an event. But usually that means that your seizure is a focal onset seizure, and usually you tend to have your hemiparesis on the same side. And then Sunna started having it on the right and the left, and just things just weren't working out. The treatment that we, we put her on seizure medication, and she just kept coming in. And then she had a history from infancy that she had nystagmus of her eye movements that I could never quite put into the mix of the epilepsy. So um, I remember when I first thought that, is there any chance that this could be what it was, that she actually had AHC? And I wasn't even sure how I could be sure that that was what was going on. Um, and what I needed to do was to capture her in a spell and see if it was in fact a seizure. And I remember that it took a while to get her in a spell, hooked up to an EEG to see that they weren't normal seizures. Mm -hmm. Something else was going on. And then I think from that point, um, I told her parents that this could be a possibility. And, and I think that it was a team um, effort between myself and her parents to find the diagnosis. I don't think that... I could have done it without them, and I um, hope that they wouldn't have been able to do it without me. So, um, and then we um, started looking into what treatment we should offer her, and for a while I felt that we were really doing a good job, and she wasn't having a lot of spells. And um, we started noting that stopping her spells was of the utmost importance, so trying to put her to sleep when she had her spells, and we tried that a while um, for a while. And that seemed to be working, that if we could capture the spell right at the onset and we could put her to sleep, um, either just by rocking her or singing to her or giving her some medication, that when she woke up, the spell had subsided and she was back to her baseline. Um, I, th I can imagine that life for them was extremely difficult because you had to prevent all things that would um, provoke a spell. And I think that that sort of took over their family life for a while and maybe still does. But, um, and then there were periods that we totally lost control and she would have bilateral spells. And, and I remember a trip they took once um, to Denmark or somewhere where she was in spells for, for a day or more where she really couldn't do anything except move her eyes. And, and, um, and when they showed me that video of what she was like during that trip abroad, it, it, it was astounding to see how, how completely paralyzed she was. I, I don't think I ever fully knew the severity of the spell. So I think that the home videos really have opened into 
for us as the clinicians that see the patient on a set time in an office somewhere under very abnormal conditions for the child, uh, the home videos, both as an epileptologist and in dealing with episodic uh, events that you're not sure what is, it's been life-changing for us because now we can see what the spell looked like and it often helps a lot. We couldn't find, or I couldn't find, anything that told me that stopping the spells would have any uh, effect on her overall cognition later in life. Um, and when you read the literature, it was more that the more spells that you have, probably the more severe AHC you have, thus the more severely cognitively disabled you'll be. Mm -hmm. So we weren't sure. We just, I think that it was our gut feeling that the spells were so difficult for the child that we wanted to limit them. Not, I think we weren't initially thinking about her prognosis. We just wanted to stop them there, uh, especially because the parents noted that if she did have a prolonged spell, that she it took her so long to recover, and sometimes they felt that there was a new deficit that really didn't come back with her abilities in daily living. So we didn't have much to back us up on on treating her this way. And I think that maybe the reason that this worked for her and might not work for everyone is just the frequency of your spells. You know, kids that are having multiple spells a day, and that's their baseline frequency, I think it would be hard maybe to treat individual spells. But in Sunna, it worked um, for us for a while. Um, but then, as often is the case, other things started coming up and there is sort of a waxing, waning kind of um, frequency. Well, I think that after having worked in a few different types of facilities, all from being at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where you have everything, you know, just within the same building, going back home to Iceland, where resources are there, but they are not quite at your fingertips. It takes a while. You have to wait for things. And, and there are certain studies that we do not do there. And then going to maybe a smaller facility in the States where, you know, we don't have everything, but we have a lot, then you start, you have to have faith in yourself and you have to listen to the parents. I think that because if you listen to the parents, they are telling you what is going on because they are there and they see it. And I think that as I have become more mature in my practice, um, I think from being a cocky, newly graduated person who felt that I would diagnose the child, that's usually not how it is. You usually take information from the parents and they are telling you the diagnosis. You just have to listen. Mm -hmm. So I think that's extremely important. And if things, if you think one thing and you go forward with that diagnosis and things just don't fit, and that's not just with AHC, that's with all neurodevelopmental problems. And if it doesn't fit, that's because it doesn't fit. And you have to step back and, and, and look at other things and seeing maybe if you, it wasn't correct or it has, you know, morphed into something else. And I think the more open you are to discussing things that are rare, um, that are going to pull you out of your comfort zone, I think that that is just very valuable if you have that trait and you keep it open and you tell the parents everything that you're thinking, because if you don't, they'll, they'll catch you, um, that you're not telling them everything. And I think that that makes it a very difficult relationship to have with them. Well, I think it was paramount for me because, and it was so, it's so strange that when you know and you've seen it, it's so obvious when you hear of the next child's history that fits with this. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't heard about it, or it's only a name in a textbook that you read, it's so hard. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and thinking that, you know, there are less than a thousand patients in the world, I think, that have known and just in the States, we have 1,200 child neurologists. That's less than a patient per person. And so it is going to be, you know, the majority of child neurologists who have never seen this. But if, if we keep it um, visible and we try to um, tell people what they are looking for, then it's going to be easier for them to diagnose when the first one comes through their door. And in the end, that's what happens. They yeah. just come to your ER and pretend to have epilepsy like Sunna did. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the flunarazine is helpful. Um, that's at least my experience, that it is helpful, but it is, it does not cure. It, it limits, it decreases the frequency, and often and my feeling is that it decreases the severity of the attacks that a child has, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So when you know that and you start, then I think you're happy with the results, even though they're modest. Um, the other treatments that we have tried with the chloral hydrate that we used a lot that unfortunately is you really can't get that anywhere anymore. So that has sort of um, is inaccessible to us. And then the, to the topiramate that we used for a while, I think that that also has a modest additional effect in my experience. Um, and, um, but nothing else that I'm aware of that really works apart from then using benzodiazepines sort of maybe to stop the spells. I mean, I think that my feeling is, and, and what do I know really, is that the, um, the medical marijuana um, is going to be helpful in a lot of different things. Um, so I think that because it is an inhibitor in the central nervous system, that I think it has, it's plausible that it will help. Um, and knowing that Dravé is also an ion channel um, problem that that might be where we will get an additional effect my feeling is that in the end what might that we need to find a solution yes. like a gene therapy or, or something mm -hmm. that really gives us some lasting um, a lasting cure but the problem is that often with those disorders then time is of the essence because if you have a child who has veered off the normal um, path for development, it's often hard to get them back on. So okay. I think that that is going to be really when it starts being paramount to picking these kids up, you know, even at birth before they start having their spells. And, and as soon as we know the gene and we know that it, it is the explanation for the vast majority, as soon as we have a treatment that would be curative, we could start pushing for that to be part of the neonatal screening. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether that will be. But I think that is where, where we're looking. And now that we know the gene, nothing's impossible. My recommendation to parents would be number one, is to um, let the people doing research know that you're behind them 110%. So if there's a question of, giving blood samples from the parents or something that you can, as an individual, do to help. There are so few individuals with um, AHC that the more specimens that they have, the quicker they will be to figure out what exactly is the pathophysiology of the problem. Now we know the gene. We know that there are allelic um, disorders that have mutations or in the same gene, but a totally different um, phenotype. And I think that that is very interesting to try to figure out what does this mutation do that makes the children have the very severe AHC while the, this type of mutation causes a totally different spectra, even though there is some overlap. Mm -hmm. And then I think it is to look at the research, look at things that other people have found helpful and, um, and see if that would be something that you could bring into your home. Um, and that would be trial medication, um, stopping medication that you feel is not working. Um, there are now um, individuals um, actually with atypical AHC that feel that the ketogenic diet is helpful. I mean, we'll find things that will be helpful for some, maybe not all. And I think that being open-minded in trying things and also being very vigorous in being an advocate for your child and not um, allowing people to tell you that children with disabilities should go to this school with this number of, of children and this amount of noise in the room or something that you know is not going to work for your child, then you also have to be firm and believe in yourself that you know what is going to be best for your child and do it that way. I think that would be my main recommendation. How can you sum up uh, kind of a physician-patient um, working relationship when you're in pediatrics is 
that sometimes at the beginning, you know more of what is destined to happen for that patient and their family than you can ever tell them. And I think that when you diagnose someone as early as Sunna was diagnosed with a disorder that you know is going to lead to disability, you sometimes feel as the child then veers off the path of normal development that if you could only be a better physician or do something better that you could have limited the amount of, of problems or, or, or um, pain that this patient will endure. And I had to stop myself, not just with this patient, but other patients, that you have to know that you're doing your best and, um, and that you will not be able to stop what is going to happen. And the problem is the patient's um, disorder more than it is the lack of your longing to help. So I think that's number one. Um, my feeling with Sunna um, when I met her at first was and we discussed that multiple times with her parents, that she was doing extraordinarily well, that her development seemed better than I would have thought. And, but then as her, the frequency and severity of her attacks became uh, more, then you could see how much effect that was having on her development. And I do think that it is linked. Um, do I think if I would have been able to stop all of her spells that she would have been normal? I, I have a hard time saying that. But I do think that the less spells that you can help the patient to have, um, the, the better their development will be. And we see that now with Sunna, that she's making a remarkable, um, positive and steep um, developmental trajectory now um, in her um, old age of childhood than maybe for a period when she was a toddler. So I think that that's, that that's great. Um, but I think that um, it's difficult to watch a child who you feel was normal um, then sort of lag behind. And, and that is difficult. Mm -hmm.